পারবেন কমালানে আচ্ছা আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে দিয়া Am I audible, Hantona? Am I audible? Hello? Hello? Okay. Yes. Uh, we're going to start at the second day of our national webinar so i'd like to start good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to the second day of our national webinar on peace security and social justice impact of covid-19 pandemic on women organized by women's cell in association with iqsc bahana college jorhat 
Our esteemed principal, Dr. Prasanna Kumar Dutta, sir, respected invitees, Professor Strimya Dakar from Northeastern Hill University, Meghalaya, Mrs. Minakshi Barthakur Ma'am, consultant psychologist, Institute of Positive Mental Health and Research from Mind India, and Mrs. Sandhana Bhuya, psychologist and therapist, Pratiksha Hospital, Guwahati, Assam, India. Distinguished members of the Bahana College family, learned academics from different parts of the country and students across India. It is indeed my honor and pleasure to welcome all of you once again on this virtual meeting platform of Google Meet and YouTube Live. And now we would like to proceed as per the schedule of our second day of the webinar for which we have with us our Honorable IQAC Coordinator, Dr. Rafiq Ahmed Sir. Sir is HOD, Department of Economics, and also joint convener of this national webinar. I would like to request now Dr. Rafiq Ahmed Sir to please address the online audience with his welcome speech. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Samita Das. I would like to start with a quote. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much, which this word is saying of Helen Keller. I am going to present welcome address of today's program. A hearty good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bahuna College is located in a rural area of Upper Assam on the southern bank of the mighty Brahmaputra, just 8 kilometers away from district headquarters. Zurhat is the headquarters. The college was set up in the year 1966 with a effort of thousand hands. Under the leadership of the late Ram Kumar, the founder of the late Dulal Chandra Bulwa, ex PWD minister, Dr. Vassam, and late Gonish Chandra Dutta, a renowned advocate. Since then, it has traversed a glorious part of development, celebrating its golden jubilee in the year 2016. With two esteemed arts and science, present students' strength of the college is more than 1,200. In 2015, the college went under the second cycle of NAC's assessment and was awarded B+. With the first vision and mission, in 2004, the IQC of the college has been accomplishing a series of academic research and extension activities for quality enhancement and sustenance, most of the time in association with some agencies. To which this national webinar on peace, security, and social justice impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women associated with the women's sale of the college is just one more addition. In this occasion, we are glad to have with us the distinguished resource persons, Professor Stimle Dakar, Northeastern Hill in Hills University, Meghalaya, and Mrs. Minakshi Bhattakur, consultant psychologist, Mind India. On behalf of the college community, I welcome both of you to this national webinar as well as to our colleagues. We expect your presentation today will explore new areas of thoughts and actions. Respected participants, you are from different parts of the country. Here acclaims the major part of success of this occasion. I also welcome all of you to be with us here today. Amidst the threats of COVID-19 and also extensive life in Assam, your presence in this national webinar is nothing but a proof of continuous quest for quality development and excellence. Stay safe, stay active. Once again, I welcome all of you. I thank the principal of our college, Dr. P.K. Dr. being a leading part of this webinar. Thanks to the women's cell of the college for initiative to organize such a mind-blowing and relevant program. Thanks to all other effort makers behind this webinar mechanism and technicalities, I would like to conclude my saying, your mind is a garden, your thoughts are the seeds, you can grow flowers or you can grow wheat. May this national webinar enrich you to grow flowers all around. Thank you, thank you all. Over to Sangeeta. Thank you so much, sir, for your welcome speech and also for addressing our delegates as well as online participants. Now we will move on to the lecture session two, for which we have with us 
Professor Streamlet Dakar Ma'am from Northeastern Hill University, Meghalaya. But before handing over this session, I would like to introduce Ma'am to our online participants. Professor Streamlet Dakar is an eminent Kasi poet, dramatist, playwright, critic, and scholar. She did her MA in Kasi, then MPhil, and then PhD. She started her career as professor, former head of Kasi department, Nehu. She is also former state representative to Sahitya Academy, New Delhi, former Niger coordinator of Northeastern region on capacity building of women managers in higher education, former chairperson, women cell, Nehu. At present, she is a chairperson of All India Poetis and Dean School of Humanities, Nehu. She is a member of various committees at Nehu, Dibrugar University, Mizoram University, and in a number of social organizations literary associations and poetry societies. She has published 38 books self-authored as well as co-authored. She has 86 numbers of research articles. She has completed five research projects and two are still ongoing, participated in more than 400 different seminars, symposiums, workshops as a resource person in the national and international level. She also organized a number of literary research and training programs. She was also a joint secretary, Meghalaya Boxing Association from 2000 to 2010, Women Manager, Meghalaya Boxing Association from 2000 to 2010, President of Master Athlete Association, Meghalaya Chapter 2017, and Chief Advisor of Meghalaya Kick Boxing Association 2019 till date. Till today, she has received number of awards and honors, few of which I would like to cite for our online audience. She has been awarded with Mother Teresa Saman at the All India Poetess Conference Fourth Convention in 2003 at Kolhapur, Maharashtra. She was awarded with first prize for the poem The Shadow of Fear in a second Northeast Poetry Competition in 2008 organized by the Poetry Society India. She was awarded the Award of Honor for her contribution to Kasi Literature by the All India Poetics Conference at the Fourth International Convention held at Beijing, China on the 21st of June 2009. She was honored and felicitated by the Meghalaya Women Alliance for her contributions to Kasi Literature. She was honored and felicitated by the Kasi Student Union, Nehu Unit, for her contributions to Kasi Society. She was awarded with Kasturba Gandhi Saman 2009 by the Sulaf Sahitya Academy Award at the Dickert's National Mega Convention of All India Poetics Conference, New Delhi. She was awarded the Award of Excellence for her exemplary and outstanding contribution to poetry given by the Poetry Society India, sponsored by Assam Rifles on its 175 year celebration in Kohima, Nagaland. And the list is very, very long. So with this, I hope I have introduced Dr. Professor Strimlet Dakar Ma'am to our audience. And now I would like to hand over this session to Professor Strimlet Dakar Ma'am. Ma'am, please continue. Very good to one and all. Dr. Prasanna Kumar Datta, Principal of Bahana College and President of the Organizing Committee, Dr. Indrani Watharpur, President Women's Cell, Bahana College and Joint Convener, Dr. Rafiq Ahmed, IQAC Coordinator, Bahana College and Joint Convener, Coordinator of the webinar, Dr. Sangeeta Das, Assistant Professor, Department of Botany, Bahana College, Resource Persons, Mrs. Minakshi Watharpur, Consultant Psychologist Mind India, and Chandana Bhuyan, psychologist, Pratiksha Hospital, Gohati, Pavuri Nyukbora, Secretary Women's Cell, Bahana College, Dr. Chandana Saikya, advisor, Women's Cell and trainer, former capacity building for women managers in higher education, participants, students, teachers, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers, Women's Cell and IQAC of Bahana College for inviting me as a resource person in the national webinar on peace, security, and social justice, impact of the COVID pandemic on women. 
it is a privilege to be part of this webinar and I was given to talk on the topic Emerging Challenges for Women in the Post-COVID Society. I will try to touch upon few practical problems that are impacted on women in India. The pandemic of COVID-19 is completely a new paradigm and has affected globally, irrespective of class, creed, and gender. However, when we analyze the emerging challenges for women in the post-COVID-19, we can assume the amount of vulnerability that women would face in the society and their dilemma would be greater than the counterparts. Even before the COVID crisis, many women have been facing a number of challenges in their lives, be it in the family, be it in the workplace, and in the society as a whole. Though so much have been debated by social activists, by feminists, by women, study scholars, in different platforms regarding gender equality and discrimination against women around the globe, yet women are still facing these challenges up till now. The vulnerable situation happens because of the caste or the class and create, created by social norms, perception of male dominant society, perception of women having the male lens, and few other factors. Today, due to the pandemic of COVID-19, women are found more helpless than men on different phases of their livelihood, and lockdowns worsen the marginalization of women, especially women living below poverty line and women in rural areas. Mothers are worried about the health and welfare of her children and her family members. Wives are being suppressed and facing more domestic violence when she could not fulfill the family requirements. Challenges are increasingly when school closures are putting additional tension and, uh, you know, demand on women because children are to work from home. They've got lo loads of assignments and online classes. Women have to balance. They have to balance her time for household chores and assisting small children in online assessment. Equal distribution of devices to, to children uh, like, you know, mobiles, laptops, computers are becoming a great challenge for parents during this pandemic. Unequal access to technology will increase other consequences for women as she has to give preference to sons according to custom and social norms, though she wants to give equal share to her daughters. As many of the world's children switch on to online classes, online learning, girls in countries like India may drop out their studies Given the reason that they are not computer savvy and uh, or only boys maybe who have access to the internet, it could be foreseen that more jobs moving outline online post-pandemic. The digital divide might uh, uh, you know, worsen employment inequalities. So in many families with a low income, Access uh, to basic food, uh, sanitation, uh, medicines for the sick and aged members of the family, and other needs for survival have become difficult during the lockdown, and even when lockdown has partially opened. Women are, who are single parents are facing much higher problems as to how to provide the needs of the family when there are no secure jobs to sustain themselves and the family. COVID-19 
is increasing gender inequality in society as we look from the perspective of workforce. Uh, women are being paid lower wage uh, uh, than, than men. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has made the world become panic as nations struggle to control the spread of the virus. This also happens in, in our country, in, in India. While much attention has been focused on health concerns, reports of the social psychological effects arising from this outbreak have been on the rise. Mental depression, domestic violence, racist attacks are affecting humanity and these social psychological effects may have longer term consequences that may affect in the post pandemic also. I will not talk more on this as we have already, we have experts and we have heard yesterday also from the experts on psychology uh, and uh, you know, experts in the field, uh, even today we'll be having uh, also another resource person who'll be talking on this. So I will just take some of the, of the uh, challenges that women may be facing in the post-COVID society and uh, I will concentrate uh, only on few practical problems with suggestions for solutions. I will divide my uh, presentation uh, into four major aspects. Uh, I'm very sorry that I will not be able to do the PPT because uh, the setting uh, is, is not uh, working. But then I will try to be uh, focused and give as much as I could. Uh, the first uh, practical problem I would be talking on emerging challenges women in the family and increasing of domestic violence and crime against women in the COVID-19 pandemic and post-COVID-19. And I would on women and workforce in the COVID-19 and its effect on the post-COVID society. Uh, the third point I will be talking about uh, on women and health in the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. Last but not least, I will concentrate on women and racism in the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. Now let me come to the uh, uh, challenges for women in family and increasing of domestic violence and crime against women in the COVID-19 uh, and post-COVID-19. Challenges of post-COVID-19 for women in the family are increasing their domestic responsibilities. As a practice, all the household chores are done by women, like cooking, cleaning, fetching water, besides, you know, looking after elderly and small members of the family. In a number of households, the pandemic of COVID-19 has affected many families with shortage of food, shortage of water, and uh, we can say also shortage of fuel and other essentials, which are the basic needs for the family. The, the work is a woman. Why I'm saying it's a woman? Because she is always to be blamed if anything goes wrong. A wife or a mother is a person who prepares food for the family and she is, and she prefers rather, to first feed the other members of the family and will be the last one to take the leftover food. This habit of hers has affected her health immensely due to malnutrition because of shortage of food and of not getting healthy food. Women often experience higher rates of mortality and both epidemic diminishment in their livelihoods. Vulnerability and poverty are closely associated with gender equality. And women, therefore, are more frequent victims of this disaster than are men. Despite sacrificing, despite sacrificing for the family, she is often being harassed by the elderly members of the family. And this harassment is increasing during lockdown of COVID-19. 
she's often being harassed. Why? Because men become frustrated due, due to sitting at home for months, losing their income or being unemployed. Therefore, in a number of cases, they find fault with women for any simple reason. Those who are alcoholics or substance abuse or a chain smoker or stress to access alcohols or ganja or drugs or cigarettes or gutka, so on and so forth. They are addicted to either of those things. Because of frustration, such men throw their anger on their wife through verbal, physical and sexual assault. Domestic violence is affecting women of all classes. The lockdown of COVID-19 has made the matter worse because men are trying to see the shortcomings of women in a family who have to maintain and manage your time to make things in order. Homes which are already unsafe for the families living in poor and substandard conditions have acted on these social inequities like you know, gender-based violence and child abuse during pandemic crisis. Violence against women increased not only in the four walls of family, but also in the society during the crisis of COVID-19. It is reported that, I will quote, in India, the National Commission for Women, NCW, received over 250 complaints of domestic violence and 370 calls between March 25 to uh, April 2022, 2020. Sources from Hindu Times uh, News on Domestic Violence during COVID-19 lockdown say, quote again, in the second week of April, the Delhi police type, uh, the Delhi police recorded a total event count of 2,446 that pertains to the event type women. Unquote. Just put simply, nearly 2,500 women in Delhi called emergency helpline numbers, which triggers emergency response support system of the state police. Of course, these of, of all these calls, over 600 were classified as women abuse, 23 calls reported raped, while a majority of 1,612 pertain to domestic violence. Unquote. The National Commission for Women, NCW, further received I again quote 2,043 complaints of crime against women in the month of June only. This is according to the uh, updated news given by PTI New Delhi on 3rd of July 2020 at 12.40. I quote, according to NCW data, 450 52 complaints were received of domestic violence in June alone. Out of 43 complaints, the highest number were received under the right to live with dignity. At 603, which takes into account the emotional abuse of women. Unquote. Mekha Sharma, the chairperson of NCW, attributed the rise in complaints to the increased activity of commission on social media platforms. I quote, she says, the complaints have increased. We are very active on social media now. And we are registering cases from Twitter and other social media platforms too. We have a WhatsApp group for reporting cases which was not in place earlier. Unquote. So cases under protection of women against violence are, I quote again, at 450, 
250 complaints on the harassment of married women and dowry harassment, and 194 complaints of outraging modesty of women and molestation. Then, as many as 78 complaints of rape and attempts to rape were received, and 38 complaints of sexual harassment. Unquote. In a very recent case in Delhi, a boyfriend assaulted his girlfriend by pouring a sanitizer all over her face and burned her face with his lighter just because she declined to give him 2,000 rupees only. To tell the truth, we will not get the, the correct data because most cases of violence go unreported due to fear of stigma and shame in the family because of social norms. The practice embedded in the patriarchal society continues to have domination of men over women. And it seems that the society is ignoring issues of of violence against women. The Lockdown and Economic Stress Act as a, perform, a perfect storm for abuse of women. It is, it is worsened by the severe reality that they cannot reach out to helplines and lockdown has cut off most formal and informal support system for women. Yes, they cannot take the help of someone because some of them they do not have a phone or even those women who own the phone in many cases they cannot reach out as they are trapped at home under the control of male members in the family the inequality and violence experienced by women is increasing day by day and it has become a pandemic and a national crisis, and it is assumed that it will continue on in post-pandemic COVID-19 also, if strict measures are not taken by the law. Now I will come to, uh, to the um, second part. Second point, the second challenge is, uh, is on um, women in the post-COVID society and workforce. In India, women have been employed in different sectors, whether formal or informal, namely agriculture, health, education, manufacturing the industries, and in domestic work. The first issue with workforce for women is with payment. I think each, of, each and every one of us knows about the low, the lower wage that women are getting. The first issue with workforce for women is with payment. As I've said, it is seen that women are underpaid when compared to men at all times, except those women with common jobs and in different professions. During the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, most of the works undertaken by women workers have been suspended and no amount is being paid by the employers because during the period of lockdown, these women did not work. Gender norms are seen to have applied in many sectors of male employers, whether former or informal sector, and women are the ones who suffer the most. As we have seen before the pandemic, most of migrant workers left their homes for their livelihoods, even with meager salary to work in urban centers, to work in companies, in manufacturing industries, or as daily wages, uh, or as uh, weekly or monthly paid workers, and also as domestic workers. A number of these women are less educated and are not skilled workers. So the payment for them is much, much lower than the educated class. And the highest skilled workers happen to be, to be uh, you know, male co-workers. 
the impact of COVID-19 has made them more difficult to survive and even to live from hand to mouth. The four months continuous lockdown has affected them immensely that they could not even pay their house rent. And the consequence they face is that the house owners tell them to back in the house. Why? Because you cannot pay the house rent. In few cases only, they depend on the mercy of a, a few kind people. But how long? How long people will can help? On returning to the homes, these returnees are jobless and government cannot look into unemployment problems for everyone. Hence, women do not have any financial security and this makes them become distressed and falls into depression for fear of inability to run their family. Much affected are those women who are the heads of the family, such as single parents, widows, or divorcees. It is certain that the post-COVID-19 will affect them psychologically due to job loss. India already struggles with declining female labor force participation. If women's employment continues to top those comments, this will only enlarge the damage to the position in families and in society. In the context of the COVID crisis, the fear is that uh, the gender employment gap will increase suffering to women more than men. Despite the COVID-19 crisis, we have also seen that uh, uh, set of groups, women, all over India are trying to contribute to the society by working hard for the communities. They are sensitizing people about health, about hygiene, about combating, to give correct information to people of their areas about this pandemic. Running community kitchens while also delivering food to those in the quarantined, uh, whether at home or community quarantine centers, and also for the aged people and homeless. Other poor rural women who were, uh, you know, daily wages and uh, sometimes who uh, have been engaged in stitching school uniforms in the past, but now they are asked to save mask and uh, you know the report says that only in two weeks a study says that these women have produced more than one million cotton masks helping equip the police personnel and health workers while earning something for themselves see how they have to work so hard uh, you know to earn their livelihood I quote, across the country, women SHGs have risen to the extraordinary challenge with immense encourage and dedication, unquote, said Alka Upadhai, additional secretary in India, Ministry of Rural Development, which, which manages the Rural Livelihood Mission, or NRLM. The Asha and Aganwadi workers are also helping to spread information about the pandemic in communities, monitor nutrition and health, ensure food provision for vulnerable domestic violence during this COVID pandemic. But no attention has been made with regards to the meager income they pleaded for. Coming now to the to the uh, uh, women health workers as doctors, nurses, midwives, and even ward girls and cleaners in the hospitals. We find they too are suffering in different ways during the pandemic of COVID-19. Most hospitals could not provide them proper equipment or the PPE kits to protect themselves while treating the patients. 
They are the frontliners and are risking their own lives and the lives of their family by working in hospitals to treat thousands of COVID patients. These health workers have their normal obligations of care and well-being of the patients and the society, even by risking their own lives. In few cases, there are pregnant nurses and breastfeeding mothers with low immunity, they are prone to be infected easily. There are cases in, in few hospitals that pregnant nurses are denied to avail uh, during uh, the COVID crisis and worst experience is the verbal threat that if they can't come to work, they can resign. A number of health workers and staff the COVID hospitals have been infected. Accommodation is not provided for them during the crisis of COVID-19 and on their return homes from duties, they put a risk for the family members. Considering the risk that these health workers are facing for themselves and their families and the amount of compensation they get from the employer, is not sufficient at all and they are compelled to work. They are compelled to work. Why? Because of the job scarcity and also because of their moral obligation. These are the problems of the, of the health workers. Now I will come to point number three. That is the challenges on women and health in the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. The COVID-19 lockdown has had the most impact on both physical and mental health of women. Indian women are already more likely to be malnourished than men and their immunity is poor too. Women and girls have exclusive health needs but they are less likely to have access to quality health services, essential medicines and vaccines, maternal and uh, reproductive health or in the insurance coverage for routine and catastrophe health costs. I think uh, there is a network issue with uh, Professor Dakar ma'am. So we will wait for a few minutes. Yes, yes, ma'am. Sure. Please continue. 
Okay. okay. Yeah. So I'll come now to the third challenges uh, that I have. Uh, uh, I will talk on women and health in the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. The COVID-19 and lockdown has had the most impact on both physical and mental health of women. Indian women are already more already they are more, more likely to be malnourished than men and their immunity is poor too. Women and girls are exclusive. Um, they have exclusive health needs, but uh, they are less likely to have access to quality health services, essential medicines and vaccines, maternal and reproductive health care, or insurance coverage for routine and catastrophic health costs, especially in rural and marginalized communities. Girls may be forced to drop out of school to reduce the expenses in the family and they may be married off at a younger age that could affect their health tremendously. When women are at greater risk from the health perspective, due to shortage of money, girls are not able to get even the basic requirements of personal sanitation, like uh, you know the sanitary parts, uh, uh, soaps, dentals, towels, sanitizers, etc., etc. And uh, very often, their health issue is not even important. Various unplanned lockdown extensions in the country made it more difficult for them to seek help for such for such concerns. Recognizing the public health catastrophe from the COVID-19, the greatest risk will be for poor people who have other existing sickness. People who live in slum, refugees and displaced people are the ones who suffer the most and the the possibility of trans, uh, transmitting the COVID-19 is at higher risk due to their living conditions that they are unable to maintain the protocols given by the health department. Such people cannot access essential health care even in the normal times. Cases of depression and mental health challenges may be greater than before if the pandemic continues and even if the Post, even in the post-pandemic, with the increase of these mental um, health issues, uh, you know, the consequences will be uh, suicide cases that may happen not only to men, but also to girls and women. So gender inequality also persists in the living situation of senior citizens and the early women, and they face the greatest challenges in getting adequate support without being exposed to infection. It is worth mentioning that there is a case where a pregnant woman with full term delivery for delivery, she was denied to deliver her child in hospital for fear of COVID-19. She was taken from one hospital to the other and eventually delivered a child in an ambulance that has risked her life and the life of her child. I fear to say that in some states, antenatal, postnatal care and delivery services, uh, including emergency, obstetric and newborn care are not in order during this pandemic of COVID-19 that are affecting women and their health. Now I will come to the challenges number four, where I will talk about women and racism. In Reports of racism against the Chinese and other Asians elsewhere around the world are and calling it a Chinese virus due to its origins showed the deteriorated levels of sensitivity among the people of the world in our country too. Several forms of racism started the division among the people of mainstream India and other Indians of northeastern states. Because of the facial appearance and skin color of the tribal women of northeast, 
other non-tribal Indians have made the racial comments to tribal women like uh, Corona Girl, Chinky, or COVID-19, and so on and so forth. This act of racial comments has brought about shame and communal enmity that pose a danger to the tribal girls staying outside Northeast. The stigma of hatred with regard to caste, class, and religion are also causing injustice to women from Northeast. Many a time, racism happens to humanity because of different factors. Bias media has also affected the peace living of the people because of racial comments on any issue of tribal or non-tribal. Lack of information about the people and culture of the place added color to racism. There are also instances of political enmity that create such havoc of racism. People with best interests who want to damage the social harmony of the country violate the instruction of local doorbars or panchayati and also the protocol during the fight of COVID-19 and enter into vengeance with racial remarks to women. We are realizing that virus such as COVID-19 do not have race, nationality. So why this racism happens? Certain cases happen where migrant workers staying uh, as tenants in rented house in different cities of our country have been chased out even in the night without giving prior intimation and sufficient time to vacate their house during the crisis of COVID-19 just because their appearance do not look like other Indian women from the mainstream India. There are a number of racial attacks in different parts of our country. Although anti-racism movement has uh, different parts of the country, um, you know, uh, has sought to reduce open attack, there is a potential for more dangerous form of racism to worsen in the post-COVID-19. So before we come to the solution of the above-mentioned problems that I had already discussed, we can say that COVID-19 and the lockdown have worsened the situation and calls for attention for both uh, in our family and in the society because of the depression, uh, the economic stress, and the high rate of unemployment amongst the family. We have experienced gender inequality, violence against women, and ill health care. However, we have also learned several lessons from COVID-19. And their challenges, their experience, are also lessons to struggle for their rights and to live a better livelihood. With the strength of their work, will continue to be essential in building that economic momentum when the, mo when the most COVID period of COVID-19 is over. Post-pandemic recovery will hopefully lead to an expansion of rights and participation of women in public affairs so that we are more resilient to future such crises. Um, uh, can I, uh, do I still have time? Hello? Y yes, ma'am. You have time till 5.15. You can continue. Yes. Now I would like to, to give uh, suggestions for solutions of these challenges that uh, women are facing during COVID and also post-COVID-19. I will, uh, I will uh, give first on the first uh, challenges that I had already given up, that is on family and uh, domestic violence and crime against three. Uh, the responses to COVID-19 must be implanted with concern of different uh, differential outcomes, like adequate prevention and remedial methods from law and enforcement to curtail rising domestic violence on women in the family. Domestic violence shelters are deemed essential services that must remain open during the lockdowns and even post-COVID-19. 
governments should consider adopting emergency measures to help women victims of violence of any sort. Fundamentally, all policy responses to the crisis must set in a gender lens and a Ma'am, you're not audible. I think uh, Dr. Dakar is having uh, connectivity issue. Let's wait for some more time. I'm going to 
আপনি আমার কনফার্ম করেছেন আগে Uh, we are trying to contact with Dr. Dakar ma'am. If she is not able to continue, then we will move on to uh, lecture session 3, which will be shared by Mrs. Minakshi Barthakur ma'am. But first, uh, let us confirm Dr. Dakar ma'am once. Please wait for a few more minutes. Uh, we talked to Dr. Dakar ma'am and she is trying to reconnect. So we are waiting for her. Uh, really sorry because uh, due to the network problem, my internet is just gone and I had to refix it again. Okay, let me continue. Uh, now I would like to talk on the um, suggestions and uh, uh, solutions uh, on workforce. Recommendation for the government sector that the private sector to make a provision which safeguards the women employment and economic benefits to some extent during the lockdown and post-COVID-19. Government employment support in India must be extended to women workers who form a large proportion of the formal uh, and the informal sector. A long-standing recommendation of improving terms of employment for women with implementation of fair wages so that women are not marginal. Uh, initiatives to enhance digital access and skills should be scaled and, and targeted especially to women with low income in order to protect women's livelihood and to prepare them for the post-COVID economy. Streamlining of India's financial planning and reload is monetary policy by assuring minimum income credited directly to the personal bank account. And uh, government is to address also the social and economic impacts of the pandemic on the poor and most vulnerable groups, including informal sector workers and should also be uh, and it should also be taken into consideration the marginalized populations. The network of uh, ASHA and Aganwadi workers should be strengthened by increasing their pay as these are first responders 
in the crisis and also increase of their compensation and provide them with benefits at par with that of government employees. The policymakers can adopt a gender perspective to understanding uh, and analyzing the outcome of the COVID-19 outbreak and the lockdown on the economy, livelihoods, and social structures. Now I'll come to, uh, to the uh, solutions for women and health. The government must categorize all services catering women's reproductive health as essential. The government must include women in, in discussion of gender-responsive pandemic control policies. Promoting the involvement of women in decision-making in health policy as women medical officers for the care of children and women's health. Advocacy for disaster preparedness and prevention um, uh, and to, to strengthen of public health care with large investment of essential uh, infrastructure so that they can provide sufficient care to the patients suffering from other diseases also. Many response initiatives have to be local so that the interactions and interventions can be identified on the context and need basis. Personal protective equipment or the PPE kits that were given to women are oversized as they are made for men's size. It is important uh, also to include product as essential hygiene and sanitation items like uh, sanitary parts, soap, hand sanitizer for women health workers, women and girls, particularly those in quarantine for prevention, uh, screening and treatment. Clear measures need to be given to prevent and lessen abuse and gender-based violence to the female frontliners and community volunteers who work daily, during day and night. Make provisions for standard health services to be continued, especially for sexual and reproductive health care. Particular attention needs also to be paid to health care services for older women, gender-based violence survivors, as well as antenatal, postnatal and delivery services, including emergency obstetric and newborn care. So, last one of the least, on women and racism. Appropriate measures are to be implemented against racism as it has a threat to peace and stability of the society. Punishment of perpetrators should be stringent according to the law. So, I would uh, conclude by saying, in general, we can suggest that the post-pandemic long-term economy recovery measures represent a unique opportunity for policymakers to institute bold measures for more flexibility, inclusive and sustainable economies, and to reshape industrial development towards environmentally and sound technologies. In doing so, it is vital to connect women's full potential as leaders, innovators, and agents of industrial and environmental change. Uh, we can also say that we have to assert that women are sources of strength and talents in their own right. So create a gender-positive, supportive environment. And this is to sensitize the, uh, every one of us uh, uh, to think of ways in which women in leadership may foster a gender-friendly environment for the other women. And uh, needs for women after the pandemic, if we come to fiscal needs, we can say that women need security, women need the protection from social and uh, sexual harassment and eve teasing. Uh, women need also health facilities. And if we come to autonomy needs, Women need decision-making, they need sense of independence, they need economic independence and self-reliance. So women need enhancing access to legal literacy and information relating to their rights and entertainments in society with a view to enhance their participation on an equal footing in all areas. 
review own policies for its impact on women. Last but not the least, recovery from the pandemic represents an opportunity to recognize reform, commit to gender equality. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Kublai Thaniyabad. Thank you so much, ma'am for sharing with us such an informative and your lecture session was really thought provoking. Okay, sorry. Thank you so much, ma'am. Can you can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your uh, lecture which was really very informative and also thought-provoking. It is really very painful as well as surprising also for all of us to know that even during this pandemic situation where many people are jobless, homeless, they are facing survival problems and still at the same time few if not all are still harassing women in many different ways. It's really very painful to know about this reality of uh, this whole world. I would like, really need to think about this uh, particular situation and would like to thank you for making uh, this, bringing this issue to all our online audience. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, if you uh, now permit, then there are a few questions in the chat box you can see. And if you permit, then we'd like to take a few of uh, those questions. Okay, then uh, I'd like to request a group okay. of interaction. Once again, Assistant Professor, Geology Department, to kindly moderate this question and answer session. Over to you, Parvin. Thank you, Sandeepa, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Sandeepa, for your music and informative talk, and also for showing light on the problem that are facing by the moment during this pandemic situation. Now, ma'am, I'm going to take the first question. The first question is, are the NGOs and the CSR CSR initiative of corporate sector doing anything remarkable for the improvement of women's condition? Uh, can you repeat the question for please? Okay. Uh, is, uh, uh, any remarkable improve, improvement done for the women's condition by the NGOs and the uh, corporate sector for uh, well, well, I got your your question. So, in fact, you know, when we uh, when we have seen the NGOs, uh, as I've told you, uh, in their own the capacity, they are trying to help people, especially during this uh, uh, crisis of pandemic nineteen, and. Uh, uh, in many cases, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, like SS, SHGs, uh, Aganwadi workers, and ashas, they are uh, doing their um, community um, help for the help of the people to firstly understand about uh, what uh, this pandemic uh, is happening and uh, how to maintain the, the correct information given by the by the government. And uh, not to fear and not to, to spread rumors and uh, uh, such things like that. So their work, uh, you know, they have to be uh, hand in hand with the, with the uh, government also, I believe. And uh, because of this, when I come to that uh, part of that resolution, I thought uh, because of their hard work, they are also, you know, more one of the frontliners to go uh, to, to, to go to the people. So it is better that uh, the government also looked into them by giving uh, all the facilities that uh, they are needed for. Uh, I know you. I have uh, answered your question, yes. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to take the next question. What are the challenges of human teachers during this COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, as I've told you, the, uh, the the four points that I've talked uh, is about uh, uh, women in the family, 
uh, where they faced a lot of uh, uh, domestic violence. And when we talk of domestic violence and crime against women, it always happened uh, uh, in the past also. But then the, during this COVID-19, you know, uh, during the lockdown, uh, most of the uh, women are all at home and even men are all at home. And uh, I, I, I don't say that all men are bad. There are very, very good uh, fathers, they are very good husbands, but then there are also exceptions of, you know, people, uh, male people who really harassed women. So from that point of view, I'm talking not to be biased uh, from the gender perspective that uh, because, you know, uh, gender is a, is a, uh, a kind of a, a social construction. We, we create it's not that it is uh, 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 it, it is put that everybody should be uh, should be biased to no. We do have, as I've mentioned, we do have good brothers, we do have good fathers, we do have good husbands. But there are certain cases in certain families. So as we have seen from the complaints that the NC, uh, NCW had already received, that means there are also. Uh, these kind of challenges that women are facing during this COVID-19. And then when we come to uh, the second uh, challenges, well, as I've already talked, uh, regarding women and workforce. See, women uh, uh, have already uh, facing the challenges uh, of uh, getting the, uh, the lower wage, lower income than men. Maybe due to their physical, um, uh, uh, their physical strength, or maybe due to the uh, less skills that they're having. Except those women who are in government uh, uh, of uh, government jobs, or uh, you know, uh, where the government paid them. Or otherwise, most women who are daily wages, who are in the uh, informal sectors they really face the problems because of the low income. And during this pandemic, they even face the problem of not even getting their uh, their income. They lost the job. So this is the second problem. And we come when we come to the challenges for women and health, we have seen that women are facing a lot of health issues. Suppose now we are talking about elderly women who have already other kinds of uh, illness uh, uh, and uh, they are facing more problems because they are not able to go out, they are not able to be uh, administered by, uh, you know, medicines that they used to take during this lockdown. So these are the kind of problems. And we are talking also about pregnant nurses and breastfeeding mothers. They, they, they need to go to work. If they don't go to work, that means uh, they will, they'll be tried. So these kind of problems these women are facing. And when we come to the uh, uh, women and racism, as we have all known, even before the COVID-19 also, uh, you know, we tribal women from the Northeast, because of our facial uh, appearance, so... Uh, uh, you know, people from the mainstream in the, they used to tease, if teasing, that we are like Chinese. And uh, they got more chances these, uh, in this pandemic crisis that we have been called uh, Miss Corona, or they will, they are, we have been called uh, uh, Corona, we have been called uh, Chinky, and so on and so forth. You know, these racial uh, statements is very bad. I, I believe that uh, uh, women have to face these challenges from time to time. There are a number of other challenges also that women are facing during this COVID-19, and especially uh, I haven't touched the, the uh, I haven't touched the point on the women and education. We haven't touched that. Just imagine now with the uh, the instruction of the uh, MHRD that all classes should be taken online, all activities should be done online. You know, we have seen 
that uh, even see even the, a few minutes ago also the network has just gone and it has disrupted us just imagine in the online classes students from uh, rural areas students who cannot afford the android phone students who cannot afford the uh, you know the internet and so on and so forth how much problem they face these are the challenges of course this uh, you know uh, um uh, could be uh, taken for both boys and girls but i'm talking mostly for women because if we have to share the mobiles then the, you know uh, girls have to sacrifice many a times that they have to give first to the to the boys uh, for their preference so these are the kinds of challenges and innumerable challenges that we are facing during this night thank you ma'am now i'm going to take the other question why women got suspended uh, from their job and is there any legal action uh, undertaken by government to stop it uh in fact uh, you know when we when we take few cases where women are uh, have been uh, terminated uh, from their jobs uh it depends from case to case basis if if it is uh, according to the um, to the employers if it is uh, that they have violated uh, the disciplinary uh, um, uh, norms according to their uh, you know to their work uh, given in the first place then the uh, you know uh, the government uh, have to have to see how to uh, how to abide by the rules of that disciplinary action that has been taken but then the, if the if the um, women have been uh, just terminated for no valid reason i believe that uh, uh, even the government can uh, intrude in this uh, uh, kind of action uh, whether it is uh, feasible or not to just uh, make the women lose the job and book question please hello ma'am last question and go to the is covid-19 pandemic uh, establishing socio cultural hegemony in society again to be uh please mention your question again okay ma'am um, is covid-19 pandemic establishing socio cultural dominance again society in society again in uh you know as i've seen the uh, mm, many a times when we go to the uh, research of daily reports of the uh, different parts of the state uh, of our country then we find uh, it's it's you know quite different from one state to the other okay so we don't really um, see that uh, uh, when it comes to the biasness of film uh i think we have to be very careful to to give a statement because as i have already mentioned that gender sensitivity is very very important to 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 give equal um uh, uh to give uh, the the equal equally for for both uh, genders that means for both uh, male and female with regards to works or with regards to health care or with regards to education and so on and so forth uh, it is really really very important that um, uh, people who are the policy makers the government should include a gender friendly by including women to give the uh, like you know to 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 get also the uh, the opinion of women because they themselves are the people who who face the problems 
So if they are included, uh, you know, in the uh, in the decision making uh, policy, so they'll be able to understand more than the, you know just uh, be on papers. So I believe uh, gender sensitizing for uh, policymakers also is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ming, for your answers. Now, uh, this is Raji Sandeepani. Thank you, Dr. Parvin Iraqi, for moderating this question and answer session. We further like to thank uh, Dr. Streamlit Dakar for answering uh, most of the questions. I hope the participants are okay with their questions. And now we would like to move on towards our lecture session three, for which we have with us Dr. Minakshi Barthakul, ma'am. Uh, but uh, before handing over this session, may I uh, uh, please introduce Dr. Mrs. Minakshi Barthakul, ma'am, to our online audience. Uh, Mrs. Minakshi Bhattakur, she did her master's in clinical psychology from Delhi University and research training at University of Trondheim, Norway, specializing in stress and trauma, disaster psychology and risk perception. She also did international paper presentations in Paris, Berlin at the Society of Risk Analysis and at IIASA in 1999 at Vienna. She is actively involved with child, adolescents, and youth therapeutic guidance and counseling in areas of mental health, including academic performances. She is also a resource person and trainer for programs on parental management, teachers training, counseling, child care institutions, and management personnel trainings. Presently, she is working as consultant psychologist at Institute of Positive Mental Health and Research at Mind India, Royal Global School, National Law University Assam, and East End Nursing Home. So with this, I would like to invite Mrs. Minakshi Bhattakur, ma'am, to kindly take over this session. Uh, ma'am, please continue. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're audible. Please continue. A very good evening and a warm welcome to all. Thank you, Bahana Kadir Johar, for organizing this webinar, Principal Sir, the organizing committee, and Dr. Sangeeta Das for coordinating this so well. Uh, it was such an enlightening uh, lecture to listen to you, Professor Srinder Dakar, and uh, proud to be a woman, actually. <laughs> That's always so nice. And also, Mr. Chandana Bhuya for a lovely session yesterday. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on addressing post-traumatic stress disorders related to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are reaching out to so many participants today from different parts of the country. Welcome all. Being in this mental health profession, uh, I've always felt the taboo about mental health and, and mental illnesses. And uh, so I'm extremely glad to be sharing this platform and speak about mental health in these trying times. Perhaps uh, when this webinar was planned and up till today, I think a lot of changes have taken place related to the COVID-19 situation, which just goes to say that we are in an extremely dynamic position or situation rather, which is actually changing every day. So the word trauma, the whole uh, purpose of this uh, presentation today, it fits in so rightly now. Uh, we know the word trauma, it has different meaning for a lot of people, it has different reactions for a lot of people, and it has always been around in different forms and, and as part of our lives. Uh, when I was listening to Professor Stringer's um, presentation, you know, I could uh, identify the traumatic situations as a psychologist, you know, I was finding the red flags over there. So, uh, I, you know, it is uh, sometimes you're not even aware that what is happening to us. And uh, again, I think now COVID-19, the magnitude of COVID-19 has actually redefined trauma for us. It is going up to a different level altogether. Now, the most important advices and guidelines are, of course, from the scientific and medical fraternity. And uh, a big salute to our doctors and uh, frontliners. And we have so much of information that uh, some of us, maybe, you know, we can uh, actually write a, a thesis. So, uh, just a minute. Hello? The network is. No? Hello? Can you, can you hear me? I think the connection just went. 
Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Yes, ma'am. Please continue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think the network from my side. <laughs> so uh, when when we say health, we know it is a combination of the physical and the mental for the holistic development of our well-being. And every time we start thinking of something, actually our body reacts, and uh, it is extremely essential to see the psychological perspective. The fact that we are in a discussion today, it shows that certain psychological and mental aspects are very new to us and we do not know its management. Now, the research related to uh, trauma regarding the coronavirus actually or the COVID-19 situation, it is uh, slightly new, so I don't know if we can actually call it as a post-trauma because uh, for some regions it has just started for us. And uh, for a post-trauma to come, actually, you know, there uh, has to be a lapse of time for at least a few weeks to a few months. And uh, some uh, countries have already started the research, and these are the research of, of course, the immediate responses. What we can now discuss is based on disaster research or earlier trauma, which is almost a similar kind of situation. So uh, it is very sad that, you know, we can already name it as a disaster. Although disaster is only one kind of a trauma, we can still uh, relate to COVID-19 as a disaster. Now, I, I don't want to scare you, but then definitely we are looking at major mental health issues related to this situation. And uh, the trauma, it is happening, the mental trauma, and it, it might continue for a long time. But we cannot sit back waiting for it and so we focus on well-being now to avoid post-traumatic stress disorder. I will explain what it means. And relating to this COVID situation, it is very subjective. So I don't think we need to be worried about, you know, what we are going to do. But if we understand, if we know what it is about, if we know our reactions, we know our emotions and behaviors, we must be well equipped to handle them. And uh, some tools have been already guided beautifully by Ms. Chandana Puya yesterday, so I will not be repeating those. But we need to be definitely equipped with this. Now, this word trauma, you know, we keep hearing this word, and um, I tried to find out the ASMI's word, and you know, it says attack yeah, for my fellow ASMI's uh, listeners here. So there's a word in Hindi, and there's a word in uh, you know, different languages which are describing it in different ways. But uh, I think we all understand that it is definitely something that is bigger than the normal stress of life. You know, when we say trauma, oh, okay, that is something big. And it affects us in uh, different ways. Now, uh, you will notice that, you know, in hospitals nowadays, they have huge uh, billboards which say, you know, trauma centers. And then I think some of us might be thinking that, okay, this is just something physiological. You know, if the hospitals are having trauma centers, of course it is, you know, they are relating to the emergency um, situations. If there's an accident or um, other kind of emergencies. So um, some of us may not think that trauma could be also psychological. You know? As I said, that some of us are not aware. Now, uh, researchers have also found it very difficult to, you know, come across a definition. And I think trauma means uh, a spectrum, I would say. So it is something starting from the lower end to a very higher end. So it could be anything. It, we could fall somewhere in the middle. We could be very low on our traumatic reactions. We could be very high on that. And uh, I, I tried to find out a rather comprehensive definition here. Since I'm not sharing the slides, I will just read this out to you. It is is a disruption and of the psychological state. So it does acknowledge that there is a disruption in the psychological being at the moment. And uh, it actually exceeds your coping mechanisms and there exists evidence of distress and functional impairment. I will just break this up so that it's easier. So first is you disrupt your present state. You know, we all like to be at one level of balanced state and whenever something disturbs us, you know, if it's a small thing like we cannot find something that we are looking for, we get so disturbed. So this is an external event or an internal event that you are thinking of, which is going to disrupt your mind. And then your coping mechanism. The only thing that I know is that we need to increase our coping mechanism. Which life is going to show us so many things in life, you know, little things and big things. And uh, I call it the, you know, uh, coping mechanism uh, factor. I don't know if there's a word like that in psychology. But your coping capacity, your CC factor, rather, it sounds easier. So it depends on how you cope with situations. You know, they happen and then you cope with it. And then sometimes if it exceeds, there is a distress. So your whole um, functions, physical and 
emotional and mental is going to be impaired. So there's going to be some damage over there. Now, if you look at the whole day, we do so many kinds of moods and so many kinds of behaviors. So every day, you know, sometimes I think that if we actually had a CCTV camera to record the events of the whole day, we laugh at a lot of the things that is happening to us. Okay? And uh, most of the things that we think of, believe me, it just does not happen. So that goes to say that if you all are having a lot of negative thoughts about the situation now, all the others combined together, more than 60% of it will not happen. Some research says that uh, most of our thoughts are, you know, repetitive thoughts. And uh, more than 60% is actually what has already happened before. If you just look back to uh, your mind and what you are thinking, you will see that that is actually the truth. So the other 40% will be some things that has happened before, some things that you remember and you want to remember. So basically it just leaves us about 10% of what is going to happen in the future. So uh, we should try to make a clean shift of this 10% and we fill it up in a better way so that we can cope with the traumatic situations. Now, uh, there are various kinds of trauma that I said. You know, I will just name a few to you. Uh, maybe uh, you heard of uh, natural disasters and technological disasters. So then we think of the big thing, that this is a natural disaster. And then comes maybe kidnapping. Okay? Just think of the trauma that would happen to the family out there, to the relatives, to the friends, to the school, and uh, all the related people. So uh, that trauma is also another big thing. But, you know, the... Uh, number of people it affects is slightly smaller. So uh, when it is a huge group, like the uh, uh, top of the sun plus now, what are we facing now? You know, that is an ongoing trauma for us. Every year we have uh, perennial floods, every year we have people dying and people losing their homes. So always, you know, we are looking at the tangible things. There's no food, there's no house, and then very less focus or sometimes no focus even on the psychological part. Of course, now things have changed. And uh, yes, there is a lot of work, even now for the COVID-19 situation, we see that yes, people do need uh, uh, you know, uh, help for psychological adjustments. So uh, that is one natural. And then uh, something like maybe school violence. Okay? Every day you will hear, I'm closely associated with school children and uh, college going students. So I know that, you know, the kind of trauma that they face, you know, it could be a simple thing like bullying. Other friends are bullying you and you are so traumatized that you don't want to go to school or you will come home and show some show some destructive behavior. You beat up your parents sometimes, you throw things, you throw a tantrum. And the poor parents, they do not even realize that this child might be traumatized at school just because somebody is bullying him. Children always like to keep silent about the negative things. You know, very few families where the children will actually come and share what is actually uh, bothering them. So, uh, dear viewers, it is my honest request to all those who have small children or those who are aunts and uncles or, uh, you know, relatives to other children that uh, it is always nice to ask them to talk, ask them to talk about what has happened. So the behavior that they show or the tantrums they might throw or the anger that they might show, it may not give to that situation at that particular time. It could be something that has happened to them earlier in life. You know, I just want to share a small example here. Uh, children know how to uh, survive. You know, they're all survivors. And uh, we have uh, parents who come to us sometimes, so and they come and tell us, you know, we thought of a divorce so many uh, years back, three years back, and that is the time our child was doing very well at school. And uh, now uh, we have got over our differences, as it always happens in most couples, and we want to be together again, and now we cannot just handle our child. You know, he is creating tantrums in school, he's not listening to us, he wants this, he has so many demands. Now, this child, what this child did is actually during the time when the parents were so busy fighting, he decided that I have to survive, you know, I cannot take sides now. So he kept very quiet. And we human beings have the capacity to actually freeze our emotions. Yes, that is the right word. It is freezing our emotions. So we know how to put it in a freezer. And then when the times are good, we will bring it out, right? Now, my whole purpose of sharing this part of the information is that, you know, how we are going to react to the COVID-19 situation at this time. So, uh, if we have too many reactions, 
and we want to react. Okay, there will be two stages. But at this time, we are not able to react. We will again freeze our emotions. As adults, maybe we are a little bit more better in handling the situation, but not the poor children. Even the youth, we have they have so many other things to take care of. You know, they're growing children. They want to enjoy life at this time. Not that we don't want to enjoy, but they do form a different category because this is the best part of their lives. And then the other major things of trauma could be community violence, terrorism, war. I don't even need to say that. Abuse, just to name a few. Domestic violence, we have covered all this, so I will not explain uh, again. Accidents and uh, suicide, of course, I will uh, discuss it later also. And another thing is extreme neglect or deprivation. Now, again, I would uh, cite the example of a child because child, uh, child, uh, you know, childhood is very important. And we say in psychology that zero to five years is a developmental age. You know, uh, whatever, the child should have a very good child, uh, time during uh, that period because uh, after that, the development goes into other areas. Not that it does not happen because the environment plays a very big role. So don't get worried <laughs> thinking that, oh my God, my development has already happened in zero to five years. There's so many other causes, you know, social causes, environmental causes, which are going to uh, be present in your lives, which are going to change you every day. So up to the day you die, you make changes actually in your life. And uh, if a child is neglected, and then uh, there could be one situation, you know, let me talk about the situation maybe of, uh, uh, of a person, uh, uh, there's a sexual abuse, you know, uh, not the higher kind of rape or something, just maybe somebody has come and touched uh, a girl or a boy in an inappropriate way. And uh, where parents are going to make a huge human cry about that, not that you should not, please do not misunderstand me. It's not that you should make uh, should not make a human cry about that. But if the same person or the child has been neglected for the past one month by the parents, you know, they're busy partying, maybe they're busy in their own world, they're not giving time to the child. I want to highlight the fact that the psychological effect or the trauma of the neglected child will be much more, maybe, I said will because I definitely think it is, but maybe much more than that one instance of a sexual abuse. Okay, So uh, sometimes uh, we don't know, you know, we don't know that we are traumatizing other people and it's happening every day in our lives and we don't know how to reply, we don't know how to take a stand. Uh, we don't know uh, whether we should say something or not. So trauma keeps accumulating at a, to a stage where, you know, one fine day it has a physiological effect on you and you, it becomes a disorder. So uh, then, they, they, of course, there's finance and bereavement. And now we have another addition to our list of traumas. We have to put COVID-19. That is so sad. So... Uh, now, why, why study the psychological aspect? You know, so far, so good. We know the traumas, we're handling them or not handling them. Now, research has shown that there's a direct link between the traumatic experiences and the psychological impairment. And that is inevitable. It is almost like a cause and effect situation. So, as I said, very less uh, importance is given to the human aspect of how people are reacting. There could be thousands of reactions, you know, no end to it. We club them as one. Like, you know, when we say something like depression, a lot of us say, you know, in the common language, oh, I'm so depressed. We cannot say that, actually. There are a lot of things within depression, but we like to club it. So my point is that, you know, there are a lot of reactions as humans we are capable of. And our mind is working so fast, it is uh, reacting to situations. And then comes the traumatic situations and coping becomes very difficult about it. Something about childhood trauma that I just spoke about, you know, when people freeze these emotions, it is not necessary that it will come out in one particular way, but uh, it could affect your lifelong uh, situation sometimes. Again, I would like to cite an example here just to make you understand better. There was a person who had a very uh, harsh father who, and who used to scold him a lot and used to chase him with the knife sometimes. And much later, about 20 years uh, later in life, he developed a condition where he could not move his hand. So, uh, like, of course, after much uh, you know, uh, investigation into that uh, uh, issue, we found out that you know there was a psychological background here. 
and but he was able to forgive the father because uh, the father came out and there was uh, a mental disorder of the father. So the day he realized that the treatment started, he was much more happier. But he did go through a time when he could not write, he could not move his hand, and it was all related to that traumatic situation. Again, my point of sharing this is that, you know, if at this time there is any kind of trauma that we are going to discuss today, please do not hesitate to share, please do not hesitate to talk to the concerned people, professional or otherwise. It does not mean that you need a professional every time because we have so many mechanisms in hand uh, to handle our situations, you know. Otherwise, imagine all of us would have been directly connected to a psychologist or a psychiatrist all the time, you know. But no, we are able to handle so many things. It is only when it turns around to be a disorder or it becomes too difficult for a person, we have more professional therapies that would help us. Now, what is this post-traumatic stress disorder? As the name says, it is post. That means it is after the event happens. So after the trauma happens, there is a stress and actually it becomes a disorder. I don't want this to sound like a class on psychology. So, uh, But uh, just a brief thing that once it is a disorder, it means that you know there is a treatment required, right? So it actually started with the war veterans. Uh, this whole concept of PTSD, if I make it short, that uh, they used to come back from war and then they used to develop these kind of symptoms, which uh, people would not be able to understand. So it was directly related to the trauma that they faced during the war, and that is of course a huge trauma. So the symptoms that could come of PTSD could be similar to the trauma situation. Whatever was happening, whatever has happened before, or is happening later on, also. Now, this is absolutely applicable to the present COVID-19 situation because a lot of people have already started showing these symptoms. So that is why we are a little bit worried that uh, if we do not handle these things at time, we do not want PTSD to come later on. So even for stress, actually, or for PTSD, it is sometimes one time, you know, something like an accident, maybe. It happened once, but then the trauma carries on. Some is ongoing. That is something that is uh, maybe the floods. We can talk about uh, some floods or floods all over the country in other places. And then those traumas which were overlooked. You know, may some of us have been maybe uh, sexually abused by bad touch or something long, uh, long time ago, which was overlooked. In our times, there were these things were never discussed. And uh, now when children talk about it and then they tell us, oh, yes, something like that did happen a long time back. So these are traumas which were overlooked, but that does not mean the person did not go through some kind of, of changes in the mind. So that goes to say that trauma is always much larger than what the definition says. It, it could be so many things. Now, if you talk of uh, maybe natural disasters, maybe an earthquake, you know, what happens is initially there's an impact phase, there's a shock. You don't know what happened. There's a lot of screaming, shouting. You have fear and then you're help, helpless about the situation and then there's a rescue stage. I don't know why it is called a rescue stage, but it is where the individual tries to come to terms. I think it is more of rescuing the mind, what has happened. And then there could be situations of denying the situation, the confusion about the situation and also sadness about why this has happened. And then there's an intermediate period, you know, when the person comes to terms with adjusting again. So that is a time a person has uh, altruistic uh, behavior. Maybe, you know, you go and try, you're so overwhelmed by all the love that you get from people and people are coming and giving the food and trying to build your house. So uh, that is an intermediate uh, time where you could develop something called altruistic uh, behavior. And then also some people show uh, signs of fatigue. They're totally tired by what this has happened. And then comes the reconstruction stage because, again, your mind has come back to, uh, you know, what has actually happened. You have to rebuild. You have to deal with the aftermath of the trauma, the fear, the resentment, the anger, whatever you had. You know, you cannot stay. So that just goes to say that life goes on. And I think if you look back at these four points, it, it very nicely explains the situation now and we should be able to understand better. Now, these phases may not come at one time. You know, they can come and go, and then uh, it could be at the beginning of the PTSD onset. I will be saying PTSD, so that is post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, it could uh, come later on also, after some time, if it is not handled at that particular time. And these phases could be like, you know, a person comes to a reconstruction stage earlier than the shock phase maybe. So it will all depend on the individual. 
it is all subjective. I think the whole thing about how you react to situations is absolutely subjective. And uh, so it is easier. You should not be scared that you know, I will not be able to handle something else will be able, be able to handle it does not. Now, with this COVID-19 situation, you know, I think we have uh, redefined how we are going to think, how we are going to behave, how we are going to work, how we are going to educate, how we are going to shop, how we are going to travel, how we are going to pray, how we are going to communicate. So, uh, so many things are changes now. And are we equipped to handle all that? I think we are. You know, we have a lot of capacity. It's just that uh, when we heard about the women power and what women are going through, so it is so nice that every time you start thinking this, just look at the capacity that we have, which is that we don't use it sometimes. So uh, recently I came across this term, you know, this uh, whole COVID-19 situation. They're combining it everything and they're calling it biopsychosocial emergency. So you can see so many things are added here, you know. But then uh, there's positivity too. And uh, we just need to link it up with the situation. So there is a lot of positivity. So again, I repeat, we do not need to get scared. Now, there are three distinct stages. Okay? One is, I think, before the pandemic. One is during this pandemic. And one is after the pandemic. Now, before the pandemic is whatever you were before, how you did react normally, how, what was your childhood, what was your uh, early dramas, and what happened, we cannot change it. But we do not need to be worried about that because whatever happened that time, it is only the event. It is not you. It is an event and that is the time you reacted that way because you did not have any other way. Now, in life, it does not sound too good, but I think we always work in profit and loss. So there's no profit, we don't do it. Even if it is an emotional profit, you know, even if we are going voluntary and doing some work and donating some clothes, the clothes just makes us feel very good. So that is the time you have a kind of emotional fulfillment. So you are in profit. Now, if you do not have a profit, you will not react in that particular way. So uh, I always tell uh, the clients that I meet, you know, regarding the situation, some things like maybe anger, and uh, feeling, uh, you know, so lack of confidence and low self-esteem. So uh, we have regrets saying that, why didn't I do that before? Why did I get angry that time and I should have done that? So it is not that. I'm sure in that particular time, you must have weighed the pros and cons, you know. If it was just an emotion of anger, maybe, you maybe you thought that if I get angry now, the situation is going to get worse. And please do not believe if it said that, you know, anger collects, collects, and one day you'll burst. No, if you don't want to burst, you just do not burst. So there's nothing called collecting. The mind will not collect it, you know. Mind will only collect negative thoughts. That is going to harm you. Okay, but it is your choice whether you want to collect your anger. It will not happen on its own. It, it is really depending on you. And then now it is the during the pandemic stage, the second stage. So how are you are reacting now? How are you taking in the information now? What you're going to do about it? And then of course after the pandemic. So this period, if you understand, this period is very soon going to become the past distinct stage for us. Which means that it is important that we take care of our mental health at this time. Okay? So that we do not want PTSD to come later on and we don't want psychologists to be bothering us at that particular time. Now, uh, this trauma and disaster reactions, there are huge, there's a huge list, but just to make it a little bit concise for you, there, there are psychological uh, reactions, psychosocial, there are behavioral, there are emotional, there are cognitive, and something called psychosomatic when the body reacts. So psycho is the mind and soma is the body, so your body reacts to what the mind is doing. And uh, there is something called unrealistic optimism. I'm sure many of you have heard the word optimist. We keep saying, you know, I'm optimist and pessimist. And uh, unrealistic optimist means that uh, it's something that will not happen to me. So what we do is we do not take precautions. You know, bad things always happen to other people. So we take a long time in actually deciding to take action, and which is very wrong sometimes. Sometimes it is good, you know, you stay in a denial and you don't want to face the consequences. And then in a situation like COVID-19, uh, it is also something called survival guilt, which might come up. Now, what is a survival guilt? Uh, it is a survivor. As the name says, if a person had a flight ticket to go on a particular flight and somehow last minute he cancelled the ticket and uh, his whole family is intact with him, but the flight, God forbid, had a um, crash and few people died, and then this person will suffer so much of guilt that, you know, I should have been there, maybe, you know, it's not good for me to live now. So uh, the person will go through some guilt emotions and that again 
disturbs the person a lot and may not be able to function in a proper way. And uh, so it is not the happiness of, you know, surviving, but a <coughs> And I think survivor's guilt is not only with us for instances like accidents or plane crashes or anything. It happens to us in small, small situations also. Okay. So it, the name is survivor, but this guilt comes to us in many, many situations. Okay. So uh, I hope you are being able to relate. Okay, now I will uh, tell you about the behavior. You know, it's not nice to talk to a laptop all the time and <laughs> when you cannot, when you, uh, the online online session does not help us. You know, you want to interact, you want to uh, get responses from people. Uh, but anyway, this is again something we are getting redefined and we are trying to use it more. So uh, we are trying to manage, <laughs> that is what I would say. Okay. So now regarding the behavior, uh, uh, hello, yes? Should I go? Okay. And now uh, I will tell you about the behavioral reactions. So maybe some of you can relate to if it is happening to you right now, or you have seen it before when you uh, face some kind of trauma in your lives, or you keep thinking that if that happens, I'm sure more than 50% of us will think like that. If that happens to me, maybe this is what will happen. You know, so that will be like sleep problems, you start crying easily. You are uh, addicted to substances, mobile, internet, addictions, alcohol and drug use. You're hypervigilant. Oh my God, have I done this? Have I done that? And now with wearing a mask and wearing, uh, you know, uh, washing your hands, there's so many things to think of. So you're hypervigilant of what is happening. And uh, the women have uh, forgotten how to use makeup. And, you know, before putting a mask also, you know, it's happened that you put on a lipstick and then you realize, oh my God, I have to wear the mask. So there's no point of the lipstick now. And uh, it, it is just because, you know, we are not in a calm mind, we are not taking the situation in a calm uh, way. And uh, there is, of course, the social isolation, the social withdrawal. This is happening to some people that, you know, within that isolation period, they are withdrawing to themselves so much, so much, that then they are not being able to come out of it. Okay? Criminal activity is rising, and then, of course, the children who are very hyperactive, people who have conduct disorders, those things are on the rise at this particular time. I'm just giving you a few names here. And emotional, of course, we know them so well. Depression, sadness, and irritability, anger, maybe, anxiety, yeah, despair. Mood swings, very common for most of us at this particular time. One point we get angry and the other point. So our mood is totally, I think, uh, governed by what we are watching on the uh, television, you know. It is happening uh, to me also. I am sure some of you can relate to this. That if I am watching the television that time and I am getting some great news and uh, doctors will come and tell me about something. So even if it's something I had promised them before, you know, my reaction maybe could be something like, don't you see what is happening in the world? You know, how can we talk about that now or how can we do that now? But uh, children will not understand that. The youth will not understand that they have their own issues. And I will, of course, discuss more in detail about the youth. I think we have quite a uh, young crowd today joining us, a lot of students also. And then also situations of uh, doubting yourself. Am I doing this right? Am I doing it in the uh, correct way? Will I be punished for this? So it could be different kinds of emotional uh, reactions. And then physical, as I said, the body is always reacting, so there will be fatigue, you'll feel very tired most of the time, even though you're not going out of the house, some of us, you'll be exhausted, there are uh, stomach issues, there's a direct connection, we call it the gut-brain connection, so that's the stomach and the brain. So something, uh, you know, like you see a lot of children when they go for an exam, they get a stomach ache or they have a vomiting issue, so there's a direct uh, connection, and because of the anxiety regarding the exam, they, the stomach will react in that way. And appetite changes, some days you want to eat more, some days you do not want to eat more. Chest pain, a lot of us are experiencing chest pain. Uh, heartbeats, irregular heartbeats. And uh, sweating, sweating of palms, sweating of feet, sweating of the whole body. And uh, many children have also come up and people with breathing difficulties. Young and old alike, young and adults rather alike, you know, with breathing difficulties. So uh, maybe they want the diagnosis that uh, why am I positive, am I, should I test? So these things are also coming up. And then cognitive, what is related to the mind? 
again uh, depression, which is emotional and cognitive, and then confusion, cognitive because it, you have to be clinically uh, declared to be a depressed uh, person. Sadness is not depression, so we must always make a demarcation over there, although we use the word depression. And then confusion, we don't know what to do, that is why confusion, some of us might be disoriented, there'll be dreams, there'll be nightmares, there'll be flashbacks, and uh, I, I, there's a long list. Okay. So uh, this is because these are reactions to trauma. And uh, why I decided to share this list today is because uh, we have seen that people are telling us about these kind of reactions. You know, already the nightmares have started. You know, how will I go to the hospital? What will I do? Including me. And uh, so what, what to do now? And uh, I think the main reason behind this is actually, you know, our mind is uh, like a sponge. Hey, our brain is like a sponge, a small one point few grams, uh, kilogram of a brain. It tries to control our whole self and body. And uh, it keeps absorbing, it keeps absorbing everything that we get from the uh, outside world and mixing up with whatever you have come inside. So much so that, you know, uh, there's a total confusion in our minds. And uh, it's like all entangled wires, you know. And uh, sometimes... Um, you know, when you have to entangle wires, you know how difficult it can be. So similarly, you know, in a much larger degree, all this uh, this whole sponge has uh, absorbed everything, and you are like a entangled set of wires. And it takes a long time to open up all the small small wires and put them straight so that all the lines are working in a proper way. And uh, at this particular time, what happens is we are very stressed out because of these reactions, because our mind has got so confused, because of our hypervigilance, because of not eating well, not sleeping well, having bad dreams and nightmares, having our anger issues, that long list that I shared with you just now. So then, then we end up having good decisions or bad decisions. It is so easy, you know, but then the bad decision implications are always very, very difficult for us, you know, and then we have regrets later on. Only because at that particular point of time, we did not want to uh, be a little bit calm with ourselves, see the situation, what it is about, and weigh the pros and cons, and then try to take a decision that time. So we end up having the bad decisions. Uh, I wish I could hear some responses. I'm sure many of you will raise your hands and say that, yes, we have ended up having bad decisions in our lives. Yes? Yeah, okay. So maybe we can have a question and answer around later on and ask how many people have made bad decisions. Now, uh, a normal disaster behavior, a normal trauma behavior, it is very unpatterned. As I said, uh, the example of an earthquake, so it is chaotic, it is disorganized, and then we look for somebody to blame. Can we blame somebody? Yes, China coming into everybody's minds just now. Yeah. So uh, whether this disaster was preventable, again, some more things coming on to our mind. Our sense of control, we expect to experience natural disasters, but not other kinds of disasters. So we can very nicely relate to these COVID times, you know, if we look for somebody to blame. And uh, these are maybe some kinds of coping mechanisms we can use as part of the disaster behavior that we related to the COVID times. And uh, if it makes us feel good, we will go on with it. Yeah? But sometimes we are doing more damage than the right thing. Now, in normal times, we like comfort, right? We like safety, security. Purpose of this whole webinar also be safety and security. We don't like instructions. When you're smiling, we really do not like instructions. And instructions is something that uh, does not work for anybody, actually, you know? And we absolutely do not like any kind of pain. And we also do not like limits. Now comes the COVID-19 situation and changes everything for us. Our comfort is gone, our safety is gone, our security is gone, our instructions are more, do this, don't do that. And uh, thinking of pain, mental and emotional pain, and look at the limits, the kind of limits that we have now. Uh, it is also because it is, I think, a different kind of illness, you know, if I talk from a psychological point of view here. Normally in a sickness, what happens? You know, we are taken care of, we are comforted. So uh, here we are distant. We are almost ostracized in some uh, areas. And then even if you're in a hospital and getting the best care, I think you feel like an alien atmosphere with everybody in PPE kits. Even if the doctors are smiling at you, you will not be able to see them. Okay. So uh, we don't know. So that comfort feeling is not there. 
And then, of course, the instructions follow. So our brain goes into a shut mode, you know, we shut off everything. And all we can think of is, you know, the worst things. So uh, you can relate it to your normal life also that, you know, uh, I will just give an example, maybe, which I use very commonly for dealing with youths. That uh, they tell your parents tell you not to use the mobile phone, so only the image of a mobile phone will come to you. And the next time you see a mobile phone, you just want to pick it up because the image is there in your mind all the time, and you see the phone and you cannot listen to that instruction that was given to you by your elders or something like that. Not only elders, as adults also, you know. So uh, it is a different kind of an illness now. That is the saddest part. This is trauma, but it is a different kind of a trauma. So what are the feelings that are coming? Uh, I showed you that list, and these are the specific ones that I will go into a little bit of detail so that we know what to do about it. We also need some tools how to handle it. First is your fear and uncertainty. Now, uh, it also depends on how this fear has been ingrained in you. How do you respond to fear earlier in your life? Okay. Now, uh, suppose uh, I say snake to this whole uh, participatory uh, crowd. Everybody will react in a different way. You know, I might think that uh, how can a snake come in here? You know, I'm in the comforts of my room now. But somebody will might just jump out of the chair and you know say that oh my God, the snake has come. And uh, somebody will think no, 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 this is all uh, you know, it is not true. Uh, but still, I will go and check. So all of us are going to respond in a different way just because of one word that I said, snake. So somewhere in our brain, it has been ingrained that snakes are dangerous. But that is all. You don't need to. It's not that you have had an encounter with a snake once or it was once in your room. Just the very fact that you know that snakes might bite you and rest to follow. Okay. Now, uh, you have to start thinking. If you're having fear, is this fear the right tool to handle the situation? Just think of the COVID situation and you're so scared, you're so fearful. But is it going to help you? Is it going to cause you more panic? Is it going to cause you more anxiety? If so, you need to do something about it. So uh, I request every one of you to actually make a list of uh, the emotions that you're going through related to this, you know. And you have to find your point of vulnerability over here, where, what exactly you are vulnerable to. Is it the news? Is it something that your friends are telling you? Is it something that uh, the social media is telling you? So if it is that, you will slowly and gradually have to cut short the information that you're getting. A normal anxiety is absolutely fine because if you don't have anxiety, you know, something like you're going for an uh, interview. You, know, you have to be on time and if you do not have that uh, uh, you know, that much of anxiety, you will end up reaching there late. But when it starts a panic situation in you and you're not able to breathe and freeze your emotions, then it comes to a different topic altogether. Okay. Now, uh, second thing is, uh, maybe the third thing now, is actually grief. You know, there's a lot of grief related to this situation. Till uh, the grief happens to you, to something you know, it always remains as a statistical number, you know, that so many people died, so many people. And then once something, somebody you love, actually uh, you do something you love, you know, that is the time the whole um, procedure had takes a different form in your mind and you start looking at it differently. And that is a normal mechanism. There's nothing to be ashamed of that, you know, I don't feel sad for somebody who died there and I'm feeling sad now. That is how we human beings function. Now, even in grief, now there are three stages, actually, you know. There will be one stage of anticipating grief, okay, because you are going to think that somebody might die, somebody might go to the hospital, and then that is going to create some uh, emotions in you, and there will be a re situation, because when it actually happens, again, you'll go through the same emotions. And then also, in this particular situation, the trauma related to this it will be the rituals, because the death rituals are very important for us, and we are not being able to do that right now. So the grief gets magnified. I feel, in a situation like this. So this whole anticipation of fear, and actually in disaster psychology, it is said that, you know, just a small imagination, risk of a memory of that trauma or that traumatic incident is enough to bring the same reactions in you. So suppose somebody has been in an earthquake or an accident, and uh, next time uh, in a group somebody mentions the word accident or, uh, or an earthquake, that same physical, uh, uh, you know, fear, uh, whatever, reaction to you that time will come to you and you will be going through the same emotions that time or the feelings. 
Now, uh, normally we distract ourselves. You know, even if somebody says uh, fear an earthquake, you will distract yourself and you will do something. At this point of time, it is not easy. What to do to distract? What will you, uh, you know, where will you go? You know, who will you talk to? So, a lot of limitations are there. That is why we have to be even more careful of actually looking into us, you know, sit with yourself, talk to yourself and find out what are your emotions right now. Can you handle them? If not, can you talk to somebody else? Can you discuss, can you write to somebody? Uh, yesterday, Chandana Buyama, she spoke about uh, journaling and I think it's a very nice way, uh, you know, how to uh, write down your feelings and then you put it on paper so it becomes more concrete, okay? And then uh, isolation, a lot of us, uh, we are all in isolation now. There's a loneliness and uh, again, I come to depression only because I want to uh, talk about suicide a little bit. Now, in suicide also, we must know that there are usually three uh, things here. One is, of course, the premeditated, those who are planning on suicide. And I will not go to the clinical part too much now. And the one is, of course, the social causes because of a relationship, because of cultural pressure, because of family pressure. So that is the social one. And then, of course, there is an impulsive suicide also that does happen. Now, it does not happen to everybody, you know. It also means how you have been, uh, if you have been impulsive before. That is the uh, point now. Okay. And uh, if you have been an impulsive uh, personality before, you might commit suicide. Otherwise, it does not happen. So, uh, suicide is uh, on the increase now. That is a major uh, issue for us, uh, psychology in the mental health field, that what to do about it. And uh, I think uh, it is forums like this where we can discuss and we can come up with solutions later on. So this is the beginning and uh, there will be, there has to be some kind of, uh, you know, solution. And uh, the negativity, if it keeps repeating, you know, the brain tries to take a snapshot. It's like a photograph. It stays with you and you keep rehearsing it. The brain is so happy looking at those negative ones because you've taken a snapshot and it will keep repeating. You know? So if you take up a book that you know you've read before, it's so easy to read it the second time. So the brain finds it very easy. So definitely it will go for the negative issues because it is already stored and it's going to replay the whole thing as a movie maybe or a snapshot. And then, uh, then going for thinking about positive strategies and what to do and what not to do. And believe me, all the time your body is being affected. All the time. So if you love your body and your mind, this is a time to start rebuilding our thoughts and rebuilding whatever immune system you have. So uh, what can you do now? You know, you can be very selective at this point of time so that the trauma does not come later on now and also later on. Uh, news and friends and social connections. You can set some boundaries, you know, even with loved ones. It doesn't have to be that all the time you interact with somebody. You can set some boundaries and say that this is my work and this is my boundary. This is what I have to do. And uh, call, up, call up somebody every day, have a routine and structure. And um, you can, you know, uh, have a movie uh, situation at home. You know, you can have some popcorn and, you know, have some uh, chat or whatever feels good and watch a movie together. You can create a restaurant-like situation at home, you know, set up the table in a proper way with a waiter and everything. And um, substance abuse, yes, that's a big matter of concern now because, um, you know, because I think of our holding nature mostly, you know, people have started holding so much and then you want to, uh, finish it up as soon as poss uh, possible. So that is a big issue now. And then finance. Yes, I, I really don't need to go into that. We know what it can do to people and uh, the effects are going to be for a long term now. Now for the youth, actually, you know, these are the, the development stage for them. This is the time they socialize. This is the time you have social groups like sports and music and your hobbies, your routine, stimulating environments, you know, your relationship, girlfriend, boyfriend, eating out. And almost that, you know, you lose the focus on your main thing, that is your studies. But what is happening now, there is a gap over here. So uh, maybe their worries are a little bit different. You know, maybe they're not all the time thinking about the COVID-19 situation. They're leaving that to their parents, maybe, you know. So one, one section of you. And uh, so even these worries, because the growth has been stunted in some way or the other, it is a little bit a problem for them. So uh, I request the youth who are with us, uh, today that, you know, you need to find your point of, uh, you know, a solution, point of solution for this uh, problem because uh, you can come out of it. It's not that you cannot come out of it. But uh, again, uh, for women, 
Uh, that is about youth. Again, women, I will not go into it because man has spoken so well. But uh, all these things of having uh, inequality uh, because of your gender and the work burden being more. So, uh, dear woman, you know, just understand yourself, shake yourself up, you know, have a body movement, you know, do some physical activity and, and just explore. That is the main thing now. Because we cannot just be sitting down that this is happening, this is the situation, and we have to. Uh, we cannot do anything about it. That doesn't happen. Uh, a few common stress reduction techniques, if at all, trauma or post-trauma. As I said, you know, post-trauma is something a little bit later on for us at least here uh, in India. And uh, it has started. The reactions have started. But to call it a disorder, maybe we might have to wait a little time. But it is so nice to know what your reactions would be. Now, one is, of course, a deep breathing. Now, these techniques that I am going to tell you today, you know, maybe people don't do it because it's all free of cost. If you pay for them, you feel like doing it. You know, something like I suggest, do some deep breathing. You no, know, because you're breathing all the time. So what is so special about deep breathing? But yes, breathing controls the mind. The only thing today I would like you to write down in your copy, if you have one, is breathing controls the mind. Put a full stuff up over there. So the more you breathe, the more uh, like the relaxation exercise that we did yesterday, your mind gets more and more control and it's so important to control your mind. There's something called quick time out because uh, you think of something and then you distract yourself. So that is called timing out. And uh, there is, of course, a muscle relaxation technique where you go from top up or top down and relax every part of your muscle. And meditation, it is, of course, not possible for everybody. For me, I leave it to the sannyasis. Actually, you know, I find it very difficult to meditate. Maybe I've not been taught the right way, but people who are doing meditation are very happy with themselves. Keep a time tracker. Think of the negative things you have that you're thinking all the time, you know, so that you can release the trauma a little bit. If you know that yesterday you spent so many hours just thinking about the situation and, you know, stress is building up. And um, the worry window was discussed yesterday, so I'm not going to it. Think of it like a TV sometimes in your mind. You know? Just take a remote and change the channel. Go from one channel to the other and stop at the channel that feels good for you. If it is music, go there. If it is cooking, go there. And that way you can also define the hobby that you have. Think of very nice images, very, very nice images of uh, places. So uh, we spoke about uh, mindfulness yesterday. So mindfulness also means that, you know, uh, you are aware of other senses also. One is, of course, what you're feeling. And you can just think of what you're smelling, maybe, you know, and what uh, you can look around your room and uh, see the colors. Maybe you've never noticed how many colors are there in the room. So it is just being able to be present in the moment and deciding for yourself what you want to do. The technique is within us. Okay? The technique is within us. So uh, find your inner compass of calm, I call it. Compass of calm. This is a written word somewhere. I'm sure if you look up the internet, you will find it. Find your inner compass and let it guide you towards the way it should. Right? And uh, then, of course, humor and laughter. It never <laughs> lessens your, it always lessens your uh, you know, stress every time. Even if there's nobody to laugh with, just think of something and laugh alone. Make sure nobody sees you so that they don't think you need to go to a psychiatrist or a psych uh, psychologist. But my point is make micro changes. Don't think of something very big. But please think of micro changes, which you can uh, very easily do in your lives and take care of it. The best gift now we can give ourselves amidst these trying times is, of course, looking after ourselves, you know, accept the situation, acknowledge it and adapt to it. I know it is not simple, very easy for me to tell you this. Very difficult for us to invite. Uh, if I tell you focus on the positive, how to focus on positive, there's so many questions come up like that, you know. But it is a nice time to... Uh, like a lens, you know, you can look at your fear, you can look at your attitudes, you can look at your immune system, you can look at uh, your stress points and see that if you can do something. God forbid there might be another situation in our lives that we need to face again. So let us equip ourselves, you know, and uh, keep ourselves uh, filled up so that, you know, when the situation comes, we can handle it. Telephone, your phones, internet, these are distractions. It doesn't take you away from the event. Yeah, to, to, for some time they will help you, but if you do not think about the situation, you cannot. So again, I repeat, you find out how you can resolve these traumas. You can reframe your thoughts. And of course, if it doesn't help, 
You can always go for professional counseling. Nowadays, there are online counseling. You can visit at home. You are able to visit. So this whole trauma again, again, yes, it is a trauma of going to a clinic and meeting somebody for your mental health. It can be reduced. It can be reduced at that particular time. So, uh, yes, Anita, ma'am, do I have time? Uh, ma'am, uh, if, if you wish, you can continue. Yeah, I have. I will just finish it. Can I just share a slide in the uh, yeah, end? Yes, yes, yeah? sure, sure. Yeah, okay. So anyway, we have come, you know, uh, our, our whole uh, therapy is called talk therapy, you know. So when we get to talk, we keep talking, we don't stop. And as I said in the beginning, the current situation is extremely dynamic. It is changing every moment. But suppose I give you an example of a tiger who is chasing a deer. The tiger thinks that it's his great day today. And the deer thinks, oh my God, it's my last day on earth. So today, Corona is chasing us. Let us say it is very happy. Tomorrow or very soon, we'll be chasing Corona and then we'll be happy. But again, we never know because of this collective trauma. So many of us are going through the same emotions, same kind of reactions. We might all come out of this very strong and very resilient than before. Okay? And we'll have to wait and see what happens. Life is really not just about the physical pain. You need to focus on your physical health, but by focusing on the physical health, we lose out on good times. Kindness, love, personal values, your meaning in life, everything else. So hold on to your psychological integrity, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. Just hold on to it and don't let the virus take more than it has. Talk about your feelings, talk about yourself. They all I might be a little crazy, at least I know I am. But none of us are physically sick just now at this moment, so let us make the most of it. So we keep our emotional oxygen supply ready, okay? Stay safe, everyone. The more stressed you are, the more you will bend. I have a slide here which I will share with you. And uh, yes, Sanita, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. I'm almost at the end. Okay, okay. <laughs> I hope I've kept the time. No, 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 not at all, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, we can have a few questions, maybe. Okay. Yes, yes. We'll have a question session because there are a few questions I can see in the chat box. Can you see the slide? No, no, ma'am. Not it's not visible. That, no, not visible. Not visible. Uh, this is what happens when you try technology. You know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday yes, also. Yes, I, I, I can show now. Share. Just give me one minute, if you don't mind. Yes. Yeah. So this is just summing up stress actually, you know, this person here, he is so stressed out and if you really stress out more, this is what is going to happen to you and your whole body then. So my purpose of showing this is because, uh, I hope you can see that. No, no, no. not yet visible. No. I'm not too good with technology, but anyway, it's okay. It just has a picture of a person who's totally bent, I will show you uh, on my own, what is it, yeah, so person totally bent, so uh, I just want you to try, can you see now? No ma'am. No, no, it's okay, it's okay, technology is not on my side today, <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter, so just had a picture of somebody totally bent, and I want you to try this exercise at home today, just try saying that you are feeling very sad, so when you say that, how do you say, oh, I'm feeling so sad, you will say something like that. But try to say in a very happy note, you know, just jump and say, I'm feeling very sad, I'm feeling very sad. Just try if you can do it, you can do it and let me know. Yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, I've come to the end of my presentation. And, uh, hello, uh, Dr. Sanita. Huh? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, yeah. ma'am, for sharing your uh, valuable lecture with us, especially uh, about the effect of this pandemic situation on children and youth. And I'm also a mother of an eight-year-old daughter, <laughs> and who is now uh, actually busy with her online classes. And I am also being a mother. I'm all also busy with my own, own online class and uh, oh. with this webinar, this thing, that thing. And you know, the screen time is actually increasing for all of us. So I think yes. there should be a norm for all of us that how much screen time we should allow to our children <laughs> as well as to us. You know, there is a guideline now where we are not allowing children for. Uh, there, there's a different. Uh, hours given for each group of children okay. so Nimhans is working on this and uh, I, I will forward it to you of course okay ma'am and I'll for forward it to the uh, online audience also Sure, Thank sure. you so much, ma'am. Now, ma'am, if you permit, we'd like to move on to the question and answer session. Yes, yes, very so, much. So, Dr. Barbin, Dr. Barbin, please continue. 
thank you so much, Dr. Sandeepa, ma'am. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thakur, ma'am, for your lively session and analyzing the pathological aspect uh, of trauma and post traumatic situation. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to take the first question. Yeah. What are the psychological issues over the use of mobile phones by the minor students in the name of online classes during this pandemic? Right, right. So just now, like Sanita ma'am just said, you know, we are very worried about the hours because definitely you cannot give more hours. And in fact, just today morning, I had a phone call where uh, the mother said, me, please talk to my child because, you know, he is demanding the phone again. And uh, I, I had to tell her, please relax, you know, ma'am, because if I just if you give the phone, he'll get even more angry. Okay, you're, you're scolding him about the phone and then you're going and giving the phone to him. So the whole object of the anger, you know, you're handing it to him. So we, we cannot ha uh, handle it that way, actually. Now, uh, definitely there's going to be an effect. But uh, also, you know, I don't think this is a permanent uh, period that is going to continue for a very long, long time. So if you can make your children understand the importance of having a phone now for your online classes, for your projects, and uh, if they are not misusing, you know. And I think we also need to believe our children. Don't think that all the time they are lying to us and telling mm -hmm. us that, okay, I have a project and I'm doing something. I'm sure the younger generation will be very happy listening to this. But uh, let's believe them sometimes, you know, they also mm -hmm. need it. And since they're not going no, out, they're trying, as I said, you know, they're trying to distract themselves from the situation. So uh, make some time for them in the family to talk to them and bring them away from the phone. If they're not wanting to spend time with you and being on the phone all the time, I think we also need to look at ourselves that why we're not being so interesting enough for them. So definitely there will be a limit as far as the classes are concerned because it is not possible for a child to keep concentrating on an online class for so long. Thank you so much, ma'am. The next question is, can you suggest some tips for people who during this pandemic situation because during this time people become prone to depression? Uh, I, I, I just could not hear you. Can, can uh, you yes. share? I am able to hear you now. Yes, I heard the word tips. Yeah. Uh, can you share some tips for peaceful sleep uh, before during Sleep. Okay. 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 Uh, yes. Yes. Sorry, ma'am. Yes. I'm interrupting you. Uh, can you please stop the uh, slide share button? Can you please uh, stop slide share? Oh, yeah. oh now it has come. My yeah, is now, now it is coming. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you are okay. Thank you, ma'am. Please continue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Firstly, now. Uh, first of all, I think, you know, it is all the worries that we carry in our mind and definitely when you go to sleep, that is the time most of the issues, they, it comes to us because you're in a more relaxed environment and you don't have things to do at that particular time. So it's like, you know, one concentrated time, it's either early morning for some people or before you sleep that, you know, a lot of disturbances are there. So, uh, for, uh, I would ask you to maybe uh, do some relaxation exercises at that particular time. Having a warm bath and foot bath also helps at that uh, time. And uh, try to relax your body and think that, you know, sleep is going to come to you. And uh, push your worries to the next day. So, you know, we, we always say that, you know, sleep over your problems. So, put, try to push your worries and say that today I'm worrying about these, that's I'm not being able to sleep. But tomorrow morning when I wake up, I am going to think about that. So, you don't think about it, but you just give an instruction. And uh, every day, give your mind, you know, we have three parts in our brain, that is the conscious, subconscious, and the unconscious. Now, the subconscious mind, it keeps working 24 hours. But the conscious mind, it goes up to sleep as soon as you sleep. So the days you cannot sleep for some time, use that mind to give your instructions to the subconscious mind that, you know, this is what I want to do from tomorrow, I'm going to sleep nicely. So the brain keeps processing that part of the information and it helps you. I'm not saying this is a foolproof way that you can sleep, but these are some of the tools. Main thing is, you know, you relax your mind, try not to think of negative things while going to sleep and try to push your problems away or handle it during the day and don't keep it for the time that you're sleeping. I'm sorry, I think for lack of time, I'm <laughs> speaking a little fast too. Uh, but you can always uh, inbox me or uh, get in touch with me later on if it's more of an issue and of sleep and having insomnia. 
So that definitely requires treatment. But it is just once in the twice it happens to you in a week and sometimes you're not able to sleep. At this time, do not get so worried. Some reactions are very normal. We just we are just worried, but do not get so worried about the normal reactions to these events. Most of the reactions now are actually normal reactions to abnormal states now. Thank you, ma'am. Next question is: When is homing apart from husband is not supported by the other member of the family for doing a job? What can she do? Uh, apart from apart from husband, uh, other but family members. Other family members. So you are talking of maybe joint family where you have yeah, other yeah. members. Yeah. Or I was asking the question while you were referring to that. So that's what I said in the beginning. You know, you should know how to set your boundaries. I wish we all knew how to set our boundaries. You know, our parents never taught us so many important life skills in life that uh, we do not know how to set our boundaries. So it's not that you are going to make everybody else in the house work and you are going to sleep. It is only because you have more work now. Definitely, you have more work now. And uh, if a male in the family is working, and suppose the person, you know, five o'clock. If both of you are working, five o'clock in the evening means two different things for a male and a female. Five o'clock for the meal is like oh wow it's five o'clock I have to go for my friends uh, meet today and a lot of music and dance or whatever you have and some party time and five o'clock for the woman means oh, oh I have to go home I have to go and cook now so you know we are in two different uh, directions altogether sadly so but yes we are now at this time when women are being working from home and there's a situation where the workload is more. Please be very calm because suppose the maid is also going out to work. Now, if that person comes back at six o'clock and thinks that everything should be in order and you have to be ready with your cup of tea or whatever you need to do, you have also been working. So your working hour has actually also finished. So both of you need to relax at that particular time. So suppose six to seven. Six to seven is not your working time. You have also been working. The other person, your husband or your spouse, has also been working. But the demands are such that. Uh, you are expected to do more. So please set your limits and uh, explain to everyone. And if you don't tell some people, they do not know, they do not understand. So it is very important to put it in black and white because there's nothing called enmity here. There's nothing called not liking. It is just explaining certain situations. Thank you. I'm going to bring the last question. How can we avoid some exam that leads to vomiting or stomach ache? Okay, okay. I'm so happy to answer this, but it will it actually is going to take a lot of time. So I'll just keep it very short, but please do feel free to contact me later on. Uh, because this is something called performance anxiety. It is there in a lot of children. Uh, we see it all the time. And uh, it is something to do with how you are perceiving that situation. So for some people, it is uh, parents who have a lot of expectations for the marks, which scares them. For some, it is your own limits that if I don't do well, what is going to happen? So you set certain limits and when you go to the examination hall, by the time you reach there, your stomach uh, reacts and you start vomiting. Right? Or you go to the exam hall, you see the question paper and your mind goes blank. So you have to do some anxiety reduction techniques for this, which is uh, which really needs some and counseling is uh, one of the best ways I think to go through this. So that you become calm before the exam or the day before, before you set out for this uh, exam. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, thank you, Dr. Parvin Iraqi, and thank you, Dr. Minaksi Bhartakur. So we have come to the end of uh, today's webinar, and uh, the next, uh, uh, in the schedule, our next uh, theme is concluding remark, which will be presented by Dr. Santana Sakya Ma'am. She is associate professor and HOD Department of English and advisor of our Omen Cell. I'd like to request Dr. Santana Sakya Ma'am to kindly present the concluding remark on our webinar. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Sankita. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Am yes. I audible? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, I do. And I hope you can see me. Yes, ma'am. Please continue. Everybody. Okay, thanks. Good evening to all. We have come to the close of this national webinar on peace, security, and social justice impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women. We are very grateful to our three very informed 
and expert resource persons for your beautiful deliberation this conversation that we have had it's not been one sided and we extremely grateful to you and we are also very grateful to all the participants from all over india for being with us present here interacting with the resource persons for give us a technical glitches you see this is a new normal for us we are still learning and internet well you know we live in a small city we do have our problems please bear with us so uh coming to this women cell this webinar or the women cell of pahana college incidentally it was formed in 2004 we have tried always always we have tried over the years to form a connect between our extension activities and our academic uh this expositions and activities webinars talks whatever we organize we try to form a link kind of so that it just just doesn't be at the level of a theoretical exercise we try to see a way forward and this webinar also is a part of that exercise over history we know that we have seen a lot of epidemics civilizations we have seen a lot of decimation we have read about it you know decimation of decimation of population but we have never heard of this kind of a pandemic and it's kind of opened a pandora's box and we keep hearing covid 19 is a great leveler it has made equal of all of us professor dekar has pointed us that it, it has not really it has not because you see that's why we brought in this issue of social justice social justice will always be you know related to our economic and gender parity and covid-19 has showed us the disparities hey how are you so in order to deliberate on these we thought we should get you the experts and the what we call the academics we the academics we the teaching fraternity should get together and think of a way forward incidentally this year to 2020 is also the 25th anniversary of Beijing platform for action you know this was uh, this un committee met in beijing for gender uh, professor karpi can tell us better actually so they had met for women empowerment and also gender parity but now antonio guterres who is a un secretary general he himself has said in his policy brief that whatever was being done is now at the point of being rolled back Now we see sixty percent of the women, working women, are involved in the unorganized sector, and these are going to be the new poor because of the closure of inevitable closure of so many industries, businesses, etc. Then economic times have recently posted that seventy percent of our global health workers are women. these women who are now giving us service are not allowed to go home maybe not meet their families uh, minakshi bhatkara resource person has commented on that so there are mental issues there are physical issues one in every five women across the world are facing is facing violence professor khart has shown us the given us the statistics of only delhi and we see the dimension of it you know this is and um i think i saw it in the diplomat yes it's a organization for cooperation and development economic cooperation and development forgive me now it was it is said that in the next few years we're going to lose 18 million of millions of indians are going to lose their jobs and over representation will be women even look at us the working working women you know there is a blurring now of whether we are working from home or it's home from work many of us are burdened many of us are burdened with children not going to school college children facing you know their own problems unemployed youth sitting at home elderly needing care so you see somewhere this thread this social emotional health all have been connected and we need to find a way forward and that is why we have had these three people to talk to you to us all of us and we thank you so much 
because of this conversation that we have had. Like uh, yesterday, Chandana Puya, ma'am, she had told us about this, uh, the primitive brain. She told us about prefrontal uh, cortex and how to manage and also the challenges and coping skills. Today, again, you, Minakshi Bhattakur, ma'am, you have also told us about PTSD, you know, and how to and the mechanisms that we can kind of develop. And I'm so grateful to know that 60% of our fears are not going to actually, you know, come true. That's such a relief. And then we're keeping a journal, you know, so many small little things, maybe which we know, but when it comes from an expert like you, you know, it helps us a lot. And Professor Dakar, you have always been an inspiration. And what you, you have mentioned about gender uh, racial, racial problems, that is another thing that has grown up and we from the notice feel it more. It's not nice to be this corona. So, you know, these are so many issues which will have economic, health, physical, mental health issues. And that is why we thank you all. And these are the things which we wanted to bring up. So, like it has been said, this COVID-19 pandemic, it has not thrown up health hazards. It is also a test for humanity. It's also a time to show our kindness. It's also a time to take it down, whatever we have learned here, to take it down, to take it forward to our students, maybe to the extension work that we do, maybe to the lesser sisters we have. So it is all for the lift. I thank you all again. And thank you once more. Over to you, Sangeeta. Thank you, uh, Dr. Santana Saikya, ma'am, for your concluding remark on our today national webinar. Now we have actually come to the end of our uh, webinar and we will conclude with a formal vote of thanks which will be presented by Dr. Indrani Bhattakur, ma'am. She is HOD, Department of Education and also President Women's Hill and also the joint convener of this national webinar. I would like to request Dr. Indrani Bhattakur, ma'am, to kindly present the formal vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Sangeeta. Good evening to everyone. I hope you all had an enriching experience from all the sessions in this webinar. Without further delay, I, on behalf of the Women's Cell, would like to directly proceed towards the vote of thanks. At the very beginning, I would like to thank our principal, Dr. Prasanna Kumar Doctor, for giving his valuable consent for conducting this webinar. Secondly, I would like to thank the IQSC coordinator, Dr. Rufiq Ahmed for his active support throughout the process. I would also like to offer my gratitude to our advisor, Dr. Santana Saikya, for her persistent support and useful suggestions for the smooth conduct of the webinar and for giving a very thorough overview of this webinar. Now, I would like to thank our esteemed resource person for today's first session, Professor Stephen Becker Nehu, for enlightening us with her insightful speech and enriching us with her words of wisdom. I would also like to offer my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed resource person of the second session, Mrs. Milakshi Bhattakur, for giving us her valuable time and motivating us with her positive approach in dealing with the present pandemic situation. Team resource person, Mrs. Chandana Bhuya, for enthralling the participants with our insightful and innovative session leader of this webinar, Dr. Sangeeta Das, for our untiring efforts in making this webinar a successful one. I would also like to offer my gratitude to Dr. Pankas Bora, Assistant Professor, Political Science, and Santana Bhuya, Library in Charge of our college, for their technical support. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Parvin Ira for successfully moderating the sessions. Now I would like to thank all the members of the Women's Cell for their help and coordination. Last but not the least, I would like to acknowledge the participants for their participation in making this webinar a successful one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gautakur, ma'am for your vote of thanks, formal vote of thanks. And now uh, it's actually the high time to say that we are uh, 
you know, we're ending this uh, two-day national webinar, but I must say it was a wonderful journey. Three beautiful lecture sessions, which were shared by our valuable resource persons. So I'd like to thank all of you and, of course, our participants. Uh, but before actually saying goodbye, I'd like to make one announcement that many of the participants uh, online on YouTube live as well as in this chat box, they are asking for the feedback form. And some of them are also requesting me to kindly send their uh, issue their e-certificates. So I'd just like to inform all of you that uh, we will provide the feedback form in your registered mail IDs. And as soon as we receive your responses, we will uh, process your e-certificates. So don't worry, just stay in uh, your tel our Telegram group and also we will stay connected through Gmail. So thank you all. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much. I hope you also get to meet in better times. Yes, of course.